morning and thank you all for coming out to Connections today and picked a great day to come, right? Would you turn to your neighbor and just tell them how good they look this morning? And the good thing is you don't have to, you don't have to lie to tell them that. You are a good looking group. As a matter of fact, you're the best looking group I've spoken to all week. And I want to thank you for for coming out on this holiday weekend. What a great Thanksgiving week. I hope yours was was wonderful. I know some of you had some challenges along the way, and that uh, that is life. I mean, they come up at, at any time of, of the day or night or, or year or season, So, uh, but you've made it through. You are here, and, and we are so glad you're here. If you haven't already, grab your Bibles and turn to uh, 2 Samuel. We're going to be camping out there, 2 Samuel uh, 23, to be exact, for a little while. And if you uh, would also grab your outlines, Pastor. Pastor Scott walked you through some very important opportunities coming up in the near future. On one side, on the other side is a a sketch outline. You can take notes and and please add anything God speaks to your heart along the way. And and this Sunday morning, today, right now, we are finishing up the series we've been in all month long in November uh, called Extreme. And today we're talking about extreme allegiance which literally means loyalty. It it means commitment. It means that I am stuck on you. I am not moving. I am not leaving. And I I am blessed to have a a really, really good friend, probably one of the oldest friends that I have in the building today. And he's been that kind of friend to me through the years, over over 30 years now. He's been the kind of friend that, that no matter what's going on, if I call him, even though we haven't seen each other, chatted for weeks or a couple months, if I call him and need anything, he would drop whatever and he would come and he would be there. And he's been that, that kind of friend that celebrates the, the victories in life and the good times in life and is also there with his arm around my shoulder when everything seems to have fallen apart. And that's the kind of loyalty we're talking about today. And I want to thank my friend for, for being there for me in that way all these years, as many of you have, just, just not quite as long as, as this one guy has. Rodney, thank you for being that kind of friend to me. And, and that's what we're talking about today. We're talking about something that has seemingly been lost in this day and time, and that's loyalty, that's commitment. It's, it's, it's not only been lost in, in relationships that are, that are here in, in this, this form, in this sense, with one another, friendships, marriages, whatever you want to want to call it, but we're also talking about loyalty to Christ and, and his people and his church. And I'm going to just be honest with you, that, that is a dying art these days. People who are, are uh, uh, loyal to the end, who are there with you through thick and thin. And how refreshing it is when you come across someone who still exhibits this wonderful trait called allegiance or loyalty. Now, this is also shown in a lot of other ways. Sports for one. How about that? Any of you loyal to a team in this room? Let me, let me see your hands. All right, half of you are lying. I know more of you are loyal than that to a certain team. It might be college. It might be pros. How many of you are Carolina Panthers fans? Let's see your hands and... Those are kind of dwindling. I, about three or four weeks ago when they were on a winning streak, man, more of you were like, yeah, baby, Panthers, woo! And now that they've lost two games in a row, what, what seems to happen is when a, when a team takes a downturn and goes through a tough time, all the bandwagon fans seem to jump off the wagon and find another wagon to hitch to and, and go with them. You know what I'm talking about? It's hard to find loyal people in this day and time. It's a rare quality indeed, but there is a desperate need for people to rise up and live lives in complete allegiance to Christ and to each other because that is one way that we portray our loyalty to Jesus Christ is by being loyal to his family, by being loyal to one another, by being there for each other no matter what happens through the good and bad times. And how many of you know we're not always easy to get along with, right? Some of you are looking at me like, like you're surprised by that statement. Really, Pastor? I mean, I'm so pleasant and wonderful and charming and lovely, and how dare you ever say, I mean, but you have your moments. We all do. How many of you went shopping after Thanksgiving this past week? See any brave hands in here? Some of you are like meagerly sticking a hand up. Yeah, some husbands are jacking their wives' hands way up in the air. Yeah, she did. How many of you did it all night through Thursday night into Friday morning and part of the day Friday? Any, any marathoners out there? Yeah, there's a couple. And, and, and did you find yourself a little grumpy at the end of that shopping spree? To the point that you went home and your family was like, hey, how's everything going? Leave me alone, I'm going to bed. Yeah, that kind of thing. 
And we all have our moments. But I believe with all my heart, if you'll, if you'll listen to this, that the world right now that we exist in, that we live in, that God has planted us in for this day and time, desperately needs to see what loyalty looks like lived out. Do you, do you agree with that or not? They need to see people who will rise up and their yeses are yeses and their noes are noes and they are committed no matter what. No matter what happens, they are going to be there for God and the people around them. I love what Louis Giglio said several years ago on this subject. He said, we only have one life. You only have one life of worship. You have one brief opportunity in time and history to declare your allegiance, to unleash your affection, to exalt something or someone above all else. And I love this part. So don't waste your worship on some little God squandering your birthright on idols made only with human imagination. Guard your worship and your allegiance and carefully evaluate all potential takers. I can't stress to you enough how big allegiance is. How big loyalty is. And as you already know, it's going to be tested continually. Do you realize that? Your allegiance to God and to those around you is going to be tested on a daily basis. There are going to be many opportunities that come knocking on your door to take away that loyalty and put it there someplace else where it does not belong. You're going to have a lot of opportunities to backstab, to put someone down. You're going to have a lot of opportunities to, to betray your, your, your allegiance to Christ by doing something, saying something, acting a certain way that is not Christ-like. So every single day, it will be tested. Know that without a doubt. And knowing this, it begs the question, how, how do we make it? How do we possibly stay loyal here coming down the stretch of 2018, about to enter into 2019? If the Lord tarries just a few more weeks, how do we do that, accomplish that in this day and time? Because you know, the excitement is good, but it'll wane with a little time. Not picking on our students from camp, but, you know, they're over here now, and this, this front row, whoosh, crickets, choop, 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 I mean, there's nothing here. When they came back from camp a couple of short months ago, I mean, they were not only here, but man, they were up here, right? I mean, they were jacked up for Jesus. They were all in. They were just going for it. Not, not to give you guys a hard time, because you know what? I don't know of many adults that's ever been on this front row except a few faithful. And not that the front row is some magical place to be, but like my old pastor used to say, I want to be near the spout where the glory comes out. Come on. You want me to preach a little bit? I will for you. But you know what? It seems like something funny happens that over the course of a little bit of time with stuff nipping at our allegiance and our loyalty day after day after day, the excitement kind of gives way. And the next thing you know, we're drifting. I'm not talking about a Tokyo drift either. I'm talking about drifting further away from the fire. So how do we, how do we stop that? Because I don't know about you, but I want to be on fire for Christ day after day after day. I want to be committed to the people in my life. I want to love them regardless of how they treat me, regardless if they're excited to see me or not. If they want to push me away, I still want to push in and love them as hard as that is. Why? Because that's exactly what Christ is to us and how he loves us and how loyal he is to us. And he's called us to be Christ-like in every manner of life. And that is certainly a big part of it. Loving him in that way and loving each other. Now, to get a biblical perspective this morning on how we accomplish this, we're going to talk about a man by the name of David who was probably the greatest king Israel ever had. Now, we're also going to talk about some men who were loyal to him as he was, was to them. They picked up the, the title of David's Mighty Men, and they can teach us quite a bit about extreme allegiance if we're willing to learn. So I, I want to challenge you with that right now. Be willing to learn. Don't sit there and think, I, I know what allegiance is all about. I know loyalty. I, I've got this. Or I don't really want to hear what this guy says. He's kind of ticked me off this week uh, already. And I, you know, I'm just going to tune him out. I came for the good worship. It was good. And I came to hear Pastor Scott, and Pastor Terry, and Joseph, and, and all those guys do their thing. But I'm just going to put it in credit. Don't. Whatever I did to tick you off, I'm sorry. But I'm not sorry. Because it wasn't anything intentional. But here's what I'm asking you. Let the if become a yes. 
I will grab a hold of what God wants to speak to me right now in this moment of time, and I will not miss this. Because I'm going to tell you something. Your allegiance is going to be tested this afternoon. And when you get up in the morning and have to go back to work after a a long holiday weekend, it's going to be tested tomorrow and the next day. And if you don't know how to stand strong in the face of those tests that come at you, you're going to fail every time. Turn to your neighbor and say, you don't want to fail that test. Go ahead. No, I need the rest of you to do that now. Turn to your neighbor and tell them, don't fail that test. The pages of the Old Testament are some of the most amazing accounts you'll ever read anywhere. And many of these stories revolve around a young shepherd boy who grew up to become a king. David was the greatest king Israel ever knew, but he he didn't become great all on his own. Like, none of us do that. And of course, he depended upon God first and foremost, but... He also relied on at least 30 special soldiers for much of his military might. They were known as his mighty men, and they themselves had accomplished some incredible feats. We're going to look at the top three of those mighty men today for just a few moments that formed his inner circle. They were Jeshoabim, Eleazar, and Shammah. Say that five times real fast. I dare you. Now, Jeshoabim was the chief of the captains in David's army, and he was famous for slaying, get this, 800 enemy soldiers at one time. Now remember, they live in the day and time where there wasn't an atomic bomb, there wasn't missile strikes, there wasn't anything like that. He didn't have grenades that he could kick, pull the pin, and whoo, boom, and do anything like that. And yet with just swords and spears and whatever else they had, those rudimentary weapons that they, they fashioned and used, he killed 800 men by himself at one time. Don't know how he accomplished that feat, but... He did it. Now, Shammah was also used of the Lord to bring victory. He risked his life to defend a field of lentils and barley. Why would he do that? Well, because the land belonged to the Lord and was given to Israel to use to his glory. Shammah did not want the Philistines to control what belongs rightfully to the Lord. To defend the land meant that he was defending the honor of God and his covenant. I like people who take up a cause and will give their lives if necessary, will stand in the gap and say, I don't care, you will not cross that line because this is God's land. Whenever somebody wants to come along and defame the church and and defile this place, we draw a line in the sand and we say, you will dare not come and defile the house of God. Sure, it might be a gymnasium where, where basketball games and volleyball games are played, but Above all else, this is the house of God called Connections Church, Belmont. I love those kind of people, and that's exactly the kind of man that Shema was. Eleazar was from the tribe of Benjamin, and he fought side by side with David against the Philistines. Now listen to this church. While the rest of the Israelite army was retreating in fear, he and David stood their ground, just the two of them. Not only that, but the Bible tells us this, that Eleazar fought until his sword was welded to his hand. Kind of funny thing happens. I'm getting a little age on me, and I can tell now that my hands get a little stiff when I do certain projects. And some of you are looking at me like, yeah, like you do projects. I'm I'm still finding it hard to believe that, but... But it's kind of interesting. When I was going through this, this, this last couple of weeks, I thought about that. I thought about, man... He held that sword for so long and so tight that literally the Bible says it was like his hand was welded, like it was, was a part of it, that it no longer was two separate entities, that they were together bonded, swinging and slinging and cutting and chopping and defending God's people and God's honor side by side with his king right there fighting. Man, I love that. I would love to be an observer there. I'd love to be on the sideline just watching that take place as these two mighty men of God stood out all by themselves against this huge army and won victory. Now, obviously, it takes a very special person to be one of David's mighty men, and yet today God wants each one of us to be that way, to to have that loyalty, that allegiance, to be mighty in his kingdom, to do great things here on this earth while we have the opportunity. And look at me. The opportunity is rapidly ticking away to where one day it's going to be gone. We will have no more time here on this earth. 
And then we will stand before our great commander and we will give an account for how we lived this life, how we invested ourselves, how we stood strong in the midst of the battle or didn't. So what kind of report will we give at that moment? I want to walk through a little bit of the story out of 2 Samuel 23, beginning in verse 13. This, this particular account that we're going to focus on as we finish up our time in this part of our service. Then three of the 30 chief men went down and came to David in the harvest time to the cave of Abdullah. While the troop of the Philistines was camping in the valley of Rephraim. David was then in the stronghold while the garrison of the Philistines was then in Bethlehem. <clears throat> Verse 15, David had a craving. You ever had a craving? Some of you are craving something right now. It's called fried chicken. <laughs> That's your Sunday routine. You got up and said, today's Sunday. I'm eating chicken for lunch. You got up and started going, KFC? I'll see you in about four or five hours. Have it ready, have it fresh. You ever crave something? Well, in this account, the Bible tells us that David had a craving and said, oh, that someone would give me water to drink from the well of Bethlehem, which is by the gate. So the three mighty men broke through the camp of the Philistines and drew water from the well of Bethlehem, which was by the gate, and took it and brought it to David. Nevertheless, now this is the interesting part. Well, it's all kind of interesting, but here's what happened. Nevertheless, he would not drink it. Would you write that down in the margin of your outline somewhere? He would not drink it, but poured it out to the Lord. Now, you might be looking at this without the perspective and the understanding of what's going on here. Say, man, how dare him? These three guys went and got this water for him. And we're going to talk more about that in just a moment, how, how that looked and what, what had to happen for that to, to take place. And yet he pours it out to the Lord. And he said, be it far from me, O Lord, that I should do this. Shall I drink the blood of the men who went in jeopardy of their lives? Therefore, he would not drink it. And then the last sentence in verse 17 says, these things the three mighty men did. It's kind of easy to see why these were known as David's mighty men. But I don't think they were chosen by David or renowned throughout Israel simply because of their physical might or their prowess with a sword or a sling or a spear. Now, there are far greater reasons why these men were mighty. In Shema's case, it was his loyalty to God that caused him to risk his life in defense of a, of a barley field. What makes Eliezer's story so powerful is that he stood his ground beside his king. He was both loyal and brave. And the same can be said of these three men as well as soldiers of Christ today. So what can we learn? Three simple but powerful lessons of what allegiance really looks like when it's lived out. Because look at me one more time. Well, probably about four more times to be honest with you. But, but look at me and understand this. Everybody can talk a good game about allegiance. Everybody can say the right words about loyalty and they, oh, I'll be there through thick and thin. No matter what happens, you can count on me. Just call me, whatever you need. I'll come rushing to your side and I'll be there to help no matter what happens. And then when something happens and you, you pick up the phone and you reach out and you text, you call, you, you send a smoke signal, SOS, I'm in trouble, whatever. Oh man, now's not a really good time. My soap opera's coming on in, in five minutes and... I don't want to miss it, and I don't have DVR, so <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm not going to be able to make it. Maybe somebody else will be able to come and, and help. This is what loyalty looks like. And it all starts with the first thing on your outline there, and that's simply close. Close. And I know some of you are thinking, that's, that's not really what I was expecting on that first one. But when I say close, here's what I'm talking about. I want to be so close that I can know the Lord. I can know my friend. I want to be so close that, that I'm right there. And, and even if, because in this account, it is, it is believed that David just whispered those words, oh, that I would get a drink from the well. He didn't stand up and shout it out in that cave, oh, I want a drink. No, historians have noted and, and, and scholars have said that, that the belief is that David was just sitting there 
probably exhausted from, from the battles that had led up to this moment. And, and he just probably, he just probably whispered that. Whew. Man, I'd love to have a drink from the well of Jerusalem. But the key is, these three, how many? These three were so close that when he whispered that, and, and understand this, he's the king. He could have commanded, I want you three to risk your lives to run into the city, which is a 12-mile journey. I hadn't even shared that part with you. But it's a 12-mile journey. Remember, there's no cars, there's no mopeds, there's no motorcycles, no planes, trains, or automobiles, as it being Thanksgiving season here right now. And that's a great old Thanksgiving movie with Steve Martin and John Candy. So these guys had to hoof it. They had to get there by foot. And not only that, but they had to charge through an army of the enemy. The Philistines were out there everywhere trying to find these guys and destroy them. But they pushed it all aside. Why? Because they were close enough to hear the master's voice. What a lesson that is. How close are we to Christ in our own life? Oh, we're a Christian. I'm a, I bless God, I got baptized when I was eight and my parents raised me in church. And Do you know him now? When's the last time you just hung out with Jesus and opened your Bible and got on your face and just wept before him and prayed and, and, and communicated with him and, and, and heard his still small voice speak to your heart? I'm not talking about an experience that happened 20 years ago, 30 years ago, 40 years ago, in Don's case, 150 years ago. I'm talking about right now. I'm talking about this week. How close are you? Well, let's just back that up just another step and ask this question. How close do you want to be? Because the Bible says this to us, draw near to me and I will draw near to you. There's that mutual desire. Jesus wants to know us. He wants to relate with us. He wants to communicate with us. He wants us to daily walk with him and talk with him. And he wants to tell us we are his own. He wants to remind you of that every morning when the enemy comes knocking at your door saying you're nothing, you're no good, you'll never amount to anything, you can't do anything. The Lord Jesus wants to go blare it into your ears and your heart. You are mine. I made you and I bought you with a price. You are redeemed. You are precious. I love you with an everlasting love. But if we aren't close, we miss it. We, we miss the voice of the Lord speaking to our hearts, loving on us, blessing us, calling us. Listen, Hosea 6.6 6 says, God's great desire is to be known. God tells us, for I delight in loyalty rather than sacrifice and in the knowledge of God rather than burnt offerings. God himself is telling us, I just want to know you and I want you to know me. Have you ever heard that old song growing up in the 70s? I want you to want me. I need you to need me, Right? Oh, it wasn't in your hymn book, so don't, don't go looking on your phone saying, where was that in the Baptist hymn? No, I, I, don't, I don't remember that. But literally, that's who God is. That's why he created mankind. That's why the Bible tells us when he created Adam and Eve, and he put them in that garden, that perfect place that he came down every day in the cool of the day, and he walked with them, and he talked with them, and he communed with them. That is still the desire of God's heart today. Is it our desire? These men were close enough to hear their king's voice. And even though it wasn't a command, an official decree, they heard him say, this is what I would like. And these men took it upon themselves to rush through the enemy forces, to go the 12 miles, to get the water and come back. And present it to the king. And he understood the risk that they took. And, and he said to himself, how dare I take a drink of this water that these men risked everything to bring back and dishonor them. And together he said, this is an offering to the Lord. How dare I partake of what is rightfully God's and dishonor this holy moment. But I'm telling you something. 
it was because of the closeness of these three men to their king. Hear this, church. We get close to Jesus, we change the world. We move ourselves far away from him, nothing's changed for his kingdom or his glory. How close do we want to be? Three quick ways that we can be close, and I don't have time to unpack these, but number one is pray constantly. Pray, 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 talk to God. First Thessalonians 5, 17 tells us simply pray without ceasing. When you wake up, when you're on your way to work, during your lunch break, on the way home, before dinner, at your bedside, every spare moment in between can be spent in conversation with God. We grow closer by communicating. Number two, sing continually. You're like, well, you have me at prayer, but... That singing thing, I'm, a, I'm not the best singer. It's a, it's a known fact that those who walk around with a tune in their head and a song on their lips are often the happiest people in the world. Amen. I like to sing. I like to whistle. I like to just have that melody in my heart and my head, and, and I don't care who hears me. After all, I heard the best way to spread Christmas cheer is to sing loud for all to hear. Whew, that's an elf reference, I think. Are you a singer? Do you have a song in your heart? If not, ask the Lord to birth one in there. Number three, listen carefully. Here's something that a lot of people do not realize. Elbow your neighbor, make sure they're alert because they may be one of those people. I'm not saying they are. I'm just saying there's a possibility. And that is this. God gave us one mouth, two eyes, and two ears for a very specific reason for us to listen and look closely twice as much as we speak for anybody who has an honest desire to be loyal and a powerful servant of the king we first must draw close and then secondly on your outline there notice that they were committed The truly loyal are always committed. Ultimate allegiance. They were committed enough to take David's wish as their command. Their service to the king was not just lip service. Not just saying we'll be there. No, they put action behind it. The knowledge that their king wanted something caused them to jump up and run after it and get it and bring it back. That enthusiasm, that that excitement, that passion, that zeal. Listen, today God's kingdom desperately need Christ followers, disciples with that sort of commitment and that same zeal. Disciples who will jump to action without having to be pushed, pulled, or dragged. Really? I mean, it's in the American church, it's almost like pulling teeth to get people to do anything for the kingdom of God. And how sad that is. That is the attitude we see displayed here. I'm sure that some people may may have witnessed the behavior of these mighty men and called them fanatics or extremists. But that didn't hamper them one bit. We must be willing to risk being called religious, nuts, fanatics, whatever you want to plug in there. And the reason being is that Jesus is worth it. Paul was an enthusiastic disciple of Christ When he was converted, he left a great job to become a preacher. He gave up a prestigious position to become a nobody, as he would call the scum of the world in 1 Corinthians 4, 13. He decided not to have a family, to live the missionary life. He suffered hunger, thirst, hot, cold. (laughs) Boy, that's a funny one. How many of you know about every Sunday, about half of you go out of this place and go, preacher, preacher, it's hot in there today. I'm just burning up. And the other half goes out and says, whoo, I was freezing cold in there. Preacher, it's cold in there. To which I just want to say, get a blanket or wear a t-shirt. Come in your bathing suit if you need to. I, I'm just, I, we can't please everybody. But Paul didn't care. He went through the heat. He went through the cold. He went through shipwreck, snake bike, stoning, unlawful imprisonment, slander, public whippings. And the tradition says a martyr's death. For what? To win through Jesus Christ, his Savior and his Lord. I don't think he was complaining about anything. He was honored to give his life. He counted it a privilege and a joy to be tortured for Christ. Sure, the world thinks it's strange that our priorities, our goals, our lifestyles are different, sometimes very, very different from theirs. But understand this, lost people are surprised that you do not run with them into the same excesses of debauchery. They will even even speak evil of us, as 1 Peter 4, 4 says, 
that should not ever dampen our enthusiasm or our commitment or our loyalty to just remind us that the Lord was right when he said, blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who came before you. What about us? How committed are we? I love the spirit of the builders of the cathedral in Seville, Spain in 1401 who said these words. And I pray that this becomes our prayer. Would you pay attention closely to this? They prayed, let us build here a church so great that those who come after us will think us mad ever to have dreamed of it. If we are going to build great churches, I'm not talking about buildings, I'm talking about churches, I'm talking about community of believers, I'm talking about a family of God. If we are ever going to build that kind of church, we need a big dose of that mad dreaming. Would you write that down? I want to do some mad dreaming. You can just word it like that. I want to begin to dream in a way that just seems crazy to the rest of the world for Jesus Christ. I want to go big. I don't want to go home yet. I want to go big until I go home, right? What kind of dreams are you dreaming? What kind of passion do you have? What kind of commitment is beating in your chest? Ralph Waldo Emerson said, every great and commanding movement in the annals of, of, world, of the world is the triumph of enthusiasm. Nothing great was ever accomplished without it. H.W. Arnold said, the worst bankruptcy in the world is the man who has lost his passion and enthusiasm. What a powerful statement. How committed are we? How committed are we? But I want to tell you this last thing today. Closeness and commitment are not the only ingredients in making loyal, committed, passionate men and women of God. The last one is simply to be courageous. To be truly loyal, we must be courageous. And I put out beside that, no backing down. These men were courageous enough to obey at any cost whatsoever. Back to verse 14, it says the garrison of the Philistines was then in Bethlehem. And yet the three mighty men broke through the camp of these Philistines. The the enemy had established a permanent military installation within the walled city of Bethlehem. The very fact that they had conquered the city of David in the first place demonstrated the power and the might of their army. But in spite of the danger or the consequences, they traveled 12 miles, broke through those enemy lines, came back with the water. David's men were prepared to risk life and limb to honor their king. Courage. Courage. I don't know if any of you heard the news this week that a young man by the name of John Allen Cho a 27-year-old Oral Roberts University graduate who had the heart of a missionary wanted desperately to take the gospel to one of the very few unreached people groups still left on this planet. An island in the North Sentinel Indian island chain of, of a tribe of people that literally are off the grid still that nobody goes to because of the imminent danger that awaits. This young man had a desire to take the gospel to them. And this past week, he did just that. I I read the story after I heard it on the news. I I looked it up and read how how he made this plan and he he hired some fishermen in the the neighboring island to to get their boat and and, and take him and and get him close enough. And that that two different times he, he went ashore to try to, to make a connection with these people. And, and the first time it is said that, that his little canoe that he took off the, the bigger boat and went, went ashore on, uh, he, he came back in that with, with wounds on him from, from spears and arrows that had hit him. So he went back again. And the next time they, they, they abused him again and, and, and broke his canoe and, and he couldn't even get that back to the ship. So he swam back to the fishing boat. And they tried to reason with, don't, don't go back again. Please, let's, let's just call it, call it done. But he went back that third time. 
and he never returned. And the men who took him there said they, they saw the, the islanders dragging his body across the shore and saw them bury this 27-year-old young man. It's courage. You know, we, we think about courage. We think about silly stuff that, well, we're going to zip line across the, the gully there. And boy, it takes a lot of courage. And, you know, now we're, we're talking about something real and tangible. We're talking about risking our lives in this way and, and how huge that is. Man, we're, we're blessed to have Joey Weed with us this morning. And let's all welcome him and thank him for being here. He and his wife and little boy are our missionaries in Honduras. Go ahead. You can welcome him with a hand clap. and It's okay. Don't you just love being put on the spot? You know, what, what a lot of people don't know about Honduras, it's the murder capital of the world still, I think. It's held that rank for quite a while. It, it courage is, is not an absence of fear. Some of you know this, but I just want to share this with everybody who, who may not be aware of it. It's, it's having some fear rise up in you, but it's, but it's having that stuff that says, I don't care about the fear. I'm going to go and do what I'm supposed to do. I'm going to go and do what God's called me to do. When, when King David, who is, is in a different place in his life right here that we've been talking about this morning, when he first burst onto the scene, he was a little shepherd boy, Right? I mean, have you remember that story that, that he tended to his father's sheep out on the hillside and he was just a young teenage kid and, and scrawny and, and he went up to take his brothers some food who were on the, on the battlefront but they weren't really fighting because this big old giant, nine foot, six inches tall, was out taunting the armies of God day after day and everybody was deathly afraid of him and would not go and fight him. Until David shows up and says, what is this? How dare this uncircumcised Philistine come out and curse the God of Israel? No more. And listen, I'm sure there was something of fear that just kept gnawing at him saying, are you crazy? Don't do this. This guy is a warrior. He will destroy you. But he pushed back the fear and he said, I don't care anymore. I am going to make this stand come hell or high water, come life or death. I am going out there to stand for King Jesus. I'm going to go out there and stand for the kingdom of heaven, for the kingdom of God that is so worth it and God deserves all the glory. And how dare this man curse my God. And he made that stand despite any fear that was in his life. Listen, guys, that's what courage is all about. When you feel the Holy Spirit welling up inside of you to share God's love with somebody near you and that fear wants to grip you and say, well, you can't do that. You're not Pastor Rob. Pastor Robert, Pastor Scott, all them pastors at church that we got. That's their job. You just kind of go and do your stuff and, and go back on Sunday and pray for them. No, you can't. But, but you got to push that fear down and say, no, I will not give in to you fear. I will stand in the courage of the Holy Spirit and the boldness of the Holy Spirit and do what you have called me to do, Lord. These men were heroic. They were courageous because they pushed down the fear and they stood in God's power and they charged forward to do what God had called them to do. So there's three things this morning. A closeness, a commitment, and a courage. I believe with all my heart those are the, the main ingredients of allegiance and loyalty. And as you close your eyes just for a minute as we finish this time up, I just want to ask you, what is it in your life that may be missing? I, I hope nothing. I hope you have that closeness with the Lord and, and with others and, and you're building on those relationships daily or, or commitment. Maybe, maybe your commitment's been wavering because the enemy's been getting in and, and lying to you and, and whispering things to you and, and you're buying it, you're believing it, you're giving into it. I, I hope not, but maybe your commitment is, is struggling right now, but maybe it's your courage. Maybe you've been living in fear and giving into that fear for far too long and the Lord is saying to you today these words, and please hear this. He's saying with you, I am with you, you mighty man of God, just as he said to many before us and many that will come after us. 
just as he said to Gideon who was hiding out in the threshing floor trying to get a little food for his family to eat he came and he said I am with you mighty man of God I believe the Lord is saying to you I am with you you mighty woman of God today he's he's reminding you I am with you you mighty man of God take courage don't lose heart stand strong in me and go for it run to the well draw that water do what I've called you to do be who I've called you to be be loyal put your allegiance completely in me put it in me trust me maybe you're in here and you say you know what I have definitely struggled in this area of loyalty and allegiance in my life to God and to others around me but today that changes today I'm making that stand today I'm rising up today I'm going to be obedient to the call of God on my life would you just stand across this room if that's you I don't even want to see a hand raised I just want to see you stand to your feet everywhere across this room if God's speaking to your heart today to rise up to renew your loyalty to have your commitment only in him and those around you that he's blessed you with in your life would you stand with these that are standing right now I believe there's more in here that need to make that stand. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. How many others? Yes, sir. Come on. This is your time. This is your moment. This is your day. Yes, ma'am. Yes. How many others? Just rise up. Yes. Yes. Thank you, Lord. How many of you say, I'm tired of sitting on the sideline. I'm tired of wavering between two things. And, and God's calling me to go all in with my loyalty completely belonging to him. Thank you. Thank you. Who else will stand? And as you're standing I want you to take this next step and I want you to come to the front of this church right now and stand shoulder to shoulder with those who are standing with you today. Make this line across the church, the front of this church right now, shoulder to shoulder. And when they get up here, would you just put your arm on on their shoulder and, and they put their arm on your shoulder, united together as a body of believers and I want to ask some of you that are still seated that you feel drawn you feel led you feel the Holy Spirit moving you to come and stand with your family would you just come and right now gather around them beside them behind them in front of them I want I want these these folks surrounded with family today the family of God I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God what an old song what a powerful song that is God's working right now. He's moving. He's breaking through in hearts. There's, there's tears that are flowing. There's, there's, there's change that is happening. There's transformation. There's a move of courage coming. There's a move of commitment coming that's going to rise up and be that shining star on the horizon that, that people who have been without it, who are lost and don't even know what it is, what it looks like anymore are going to see it rise up here at and through Connections Church. They're going to say, whatever that is, I've got to have that. But it's a people. It's soldiers who are loyal to their commanding officer, to King Jesus, and who are saying, my life is His. And no matter what comes at me, when I'm tested this afternoon, when I'm tested tomorrow, when I'm tested next week, I am God's alone. I will not back down. I will not waver and I will not compromise. God, let your Holy Spirit just come and sweep over us right now. As a body of believers, everybody stand to your feet across this room if you would right now. God, just come by your Spirit and sweep over us in ways that we never even imagined, that we've never even experienced, God. Let the fullness of your power come in and drive back the enemy forces that have come in and set up camp, God. Free us, heal us, deliver us. God, change us. We're not playing games here at the end of this year as we come to the finish line of 18, God. We're not playing games, Lord. We want you. We need you, God. We can't do this life without you. Fill us to overflowing, Lord. Let us be courageous people, committed people, people that are close to your heart, God. We want to hear your heartbeat. We want to hear you whisper to us in the night, God, everything that you have for us and those things you speak over us and about us, God. We don't want to miss a thing of your voice in our lives. Come, Holy Spirit. We surrender ourselves to you. Fill us to overflowing. God, I thank you for Joey and Kelly and Connor. Lord, their precious family that's serving 
there in Honduras. I thank you that he's been able to be a part of this day. That you just anoint him fresh and new. Let that courage just well up fresh and new today. That closeness, God. Thank you for his heart that's committed to you. For for, for the, the heart of this family that's committed to you. And those people there that you love desperately. And you've called them to, God. Thank you for those same kind of dreams rising up in the hearts of your people all across this place and outside of this room. Those who are watching or listening to us right now. God, you're speaking to them. You're speaking to them, Lord. You're touching them even now, God. You're bringing change into their lives as well, Lord. It's not just happening inside of this building, God. This move is sweeping. Sweeping out of this place. Reaching far, God. God, I thank you for a young man who said, I will go. I will go when everybody else tried to talk him out of it, God. And I believe that the seeds that were sown this week... With the martyr's death of this young man, I believe those seeds are going to reap an eternal, an eternal harvest, God. That the hatred, the the, the unknown God that's with that group and that island in the East Indies, God, that's going to change. Something miraculous is going to happen, Lord. It always takes a seed. It always takes a sacrifice. It always takes somebody who will rise up and say, Here I am, Lord. Send me. God, thank you for what's going to happen. And thank you for that same missionary heart and spirit. That same loyalty. That same commitment. That same courage that's welling up inside of every single one of us today. We honor you. We bless you. And Lord, we worship you with one voice and one heart. Would you do that right now? Just lift your hands up right now as our team prepares to lead us in this song. Would you help us declare the glory of God, the greatness of God, and let's sing it out. Let's sing it out to him because he alone, he alone is worthy. Sing it out, church.